Hello, Michael Bettine here for a new episode of It's Cup of Time. And today I'm talking about basic recording. I call this Basic Recording 101. I'm going to start right at the beginning and take you through recording some gongs and then post-production of the recording into a final product. In a lot of ways, it's really not that difficult a process. There are certain steps you need to follow, which are pretty logical. And then it's really just a matter of having the right equipment. So let's talk about the gear we're having today. I'm going to use my Zoom H6 recorder, which I will have two built-in microphones, and I will use two external microphones right over here. These are Loughton Audio LA120s, in case anybody is a gearhead. And this will work for any sort of portable digital recorder, from a small one like a Zoom H1N up to the H6, or something like the Tascam X8, which I also have, which has a touch screen. Touch screen or dials or knobs, it all works the same. They're doing the same functions. So let's talk about a couple of things just to get started. You could just do a digital recording with your built-in microphones and some of the smaller units just use built-in mics. Bigger units like this one, the H6 or the Tascam X8 will allow me to plug up to four additional microphones into it. Kind of hard to see here. There we go. But I've got two XLR jacks on one side and two on the other. So in this case, I'm just using two mics in stereo. I have left and right microphones to record everything here. Now I have these in an ORTF mic array. You can go look that up on the internet. I kind of pull this out. The Zoom mics are in an XY microphone array, which we've talked about these in previous videos. I'll put some links to explanation of different miking techniques. I've got my phone here shooting the view screen on the H6 so you can watch everything. You can watch the monitor of the volumes. So let's talk about it. These are what we call phantom powered mics. These are small diaphragm condensers so they do need power. So if you are using them going into some sort of recorder like a portable digital recorder or a mixer type recorder you have to make sure you turn on what they call phantom power and that powers these microphones. If you are using a dynamic mic like a Shure SM57 or a Shure SM58 similar to that you do not need power. They are dynamic mics but if you use any sort of condenser mic you do need to power it. So make sure your phantom power is turned on. I've had that happen before where I forgot to turn it on, did a nice recording and there was no recording because the mics weren't powered up. So first thing to check. Condenser mics makes your phantom power is on. And you should be able to tell because you won't see any signal on your meters if there is no phantom power. So let's look at this. Over here, the two meters that are closest together, that is the XY mics, the built-in mics. And then here's channel one and two of the external mics, which I am using as left and right. And you can see right there it says plus 48V, that's plus 48 volts, which is my phantom power. So it's telling me the phantom power is on. And I'm recording in WAV files. Avoid MP3s if at all possible. MP3s were invented like 20 years ago when computer memory was so expensive. If you think of those early iPods, you know, they, they hardly had any memory. So MP3 files, they take a lot of the signal and throw it out and they can squash it down into a very, very tiny file. 
But nowadays, uh, computer memory is so inexpensive. I think I have a 128 gig card in my H6. I mean, I can record for days with um, WAV files on a high setting. So don't use MP3s when you're recording. If you want to later in post-production, you can export your file down to an MP3 but, and you'll lose signal quality in your MP3, but you can take an MP3 and better the quality by just making it a WAV file. You can export it to a WAV file, but it will still have what they call lossy quality because MP3 is a lossy format. So just remember, don't worry about MP3s in the recording part. Always record to like a WAV or WAV, however you want to pronounce it, W-A-V. Record to that or some other high quality lossless recording file. Okay, let's take a quick mic check here. You can see when I'm talking in front. All right, one, two, one, two. And you can see the built-in mics are getting a hot signal whereas the two external mics are not getting much of a signal. So let's turn those up a bit. There we go. Now we're getting a hotter signal. And let's just turn them up a little more. And now look, okay, see it how it's, it's just in the red and the meter pins right at the top. We don't want that because that will end up in clipping where the waveform is cut off because it, it can't go any higher than the ceiling that you're recording at and you will end up with a distorted sound. Very possibly unusable because it'll just be distorted. So you want to set your levels where they are comfortable, where you're getting green and maybe it's going a little into the yellow as a rule of thumb, it's better to under record because you can bring it up. But if you, again, if you over set your values, you'll end up with a clipping and distortion. The one problem is that you arise with is if you record too low, then you will get a lot of noise when you bring this signal up. The noise floor will come up. That's where something like the Tascam X8 and the Zoom M4 and similar recorders that use what they call 32-bit float recording, which is a newer thing out there. That's where they really come in handy because you cannot clip them and you, you can whisper really quiet like that and bring it up to a shout level and you're not going to bring up the noise level because they record at a super wide dynamic level, whereas other stuff it's not as wide. So newer technology like 32-bit float, check into that. I'll put a link down below for a really great uh, video that explains what 32-bit is. And it's not necessary to move up to that. This is fine. I've had this H6, which is standard recording. I, I'm recording in 24-bit. I've had that for seven and a half years and it's done fine. I just wanted to move up to 32-bit float to make it easier for someone like me as a solo musician. Now this is where recording becomes tricky because if I've got this in the back of the room, my recorder, and I'm up here playing, I cannot see the meters. I have no idea what's going on as far as the levels. So I always have to guess at the levels. And from making a lot of different recordings over the years, I kind of know where to set the volume levels on the microphones to get a pretty good you know, volume so that it's still going to be low, even if I play loud and I won't clip, but still it's loud enough that when I bring it up, I won't get a lot of noise floor with it. Now the advantage of the Tascam X8 that I explained in a different video, it also comes with an app. I got the Bluetooth adapter for the recorder and I have an app on my iPhone and I can stand here, I can put my phone on my mallet tray, I can be playing and I can be watching the meters and then I can go over and adjust my volumes from there. 
I can also start and stop the recorder in the back of the room. So that was something important to me. I just wanted to make it an easier job than just guessing. So even though I'm using 32-bit float, I still like to get a good level. So I like to check my levels of play and check it on my phone because with recording, a lot of people think 32-bit float is the end-all be-all. You can do anything and you'll have a good recording. But you could still clip the signal going into 32-bit float. So if I was to play too loud for the microphones here and distort the microphones, then the signal going into the recorder, even if it's 32-bit float, the signal that it will be recording will be a distorted signal, a distorted recording. And even with 32-bit float, you can lower or raise the volume, it's still going to be distorted. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say in the computer world. So you want to make sure you get an optimum recording level and signal going into whatever type of recorder you are using. And like I said, it's always been guesswork because I have to go in the back of the room. I have to look at the room. Is it a big room? Is it a small room? Is there a high ceiling? Is there a low ceiling? You know, what type of room it is and sort of guess it at the sound and what volume I need. And I don't really have time to like do a little test recording and then maybe listen back over some headphones and then, you know, I don't have time to do that. I, you know, I get my gear set up, I get my recorder set up, and it's time to go usually. But here in my studio, or if you have a recorder and you're at home, you've got time to experiment. So if you decide where you want to put your recorder, and that's another thing we can talk about. We could talk for hours about the acoustics of your room. Where should you set your gongs or your bowls? And then where should you set your recorder? And the biggest thing to do is to listen to your room. That's what I do. And I know this space really well. And I prefer, if I'm recording from the front, I prefer to have a little, I like to have some air. So this is probably about, eight feet between the gongs and these mics. Normally I use my mics that are up here in the ceiling, which are about seven feet up, seven, a little over seven feet up, and they are about what, four feet from the gongs. Those are my room mics that are permanently up there. I tried mics in different spots to find where it was optimum for me making a video. I wanted to be able to pick up the instruments, the gongs and bells and bowls and that, but also pick up my voice. I didn't want to have to have a separate vocal mic. So I found the optimum spot for making these sort of videos for my room mics. Not today, we're using these mics here. But the, the thing to do is listen to your room. Play your gong, your bowl, whatever. to your room. How do the gongs sound? How do the bowls sound? Now in this case I'm doing a nice, what I want to be a nice stereo recording, so I want the mics in the center. Normally I would probably have them over a little more here, but that would be in the way of me. So I've got them slightly off center and the recorder, this one is right on center just about. But if you're recording stereo and you want just a nice stereo sound, then you want your mics in the middle. Now you can have them, here's about what, four feet above the floor. That's a nice level. These are about five feet. Like I said, these up in the ceiling are like seven feet. So you can have your mics pointing down from up above. You could have them even. You could even go down and have them pointing up. Try different things. When you first start recording, it's a lot of experimentation to find the optimum sound in your permanent setup, your home studio, your bedroom, your living room, your basement, wherever you have your 
gear is defining where it works well. Now one thing you might want to do is with a mic stand, once you find the right spot, maybe take a little tape and mark the floor where the legs of your microphone stand sits. So every time you want to set up your recorder, you can put it in the exact same space. Just like in a stage play, they do floor markings for the actors so that they know where to stand and they know where to go to and things like that. And that's what I've done here for like my camera, the main camera here. I've got tape on the floor so that I can set the tripod in the exact same place every time so I can get this sort of a view here. All right, preliminaries, there we go. We haven't even recorded at all. We're just trying to get things set up. So again, listen to your room. And if possible, have somebody come over and play your instruments while you move around your room. Listen to how they sound. Where's a good spot? Where's a sound you like? That might be something you want to record. And this is what great engineers do in, in you know, multi-million dollar recording studios. They just don't throw up microphones. They know where hot spots in the studio are. They know how to get the sounds that they want. And even then, sometimes they'll still experiment with different mics and they'll move them around. It's not just like, okay, set up your gear, I'm gonna put up some mics and the band records. No, there's a lot of preliminary testing and preparation of the mics to get the sounds that they want to work with. So do that. You'll learn a lot just by listening to your room. And like I said, if you can have a friend play, then you can do two things. One, you can listen. And then when you find a spot where you want your recorder, you can say, okay, can you play? And you can have them play at different volumes. Can you play like really loud? And then you can watch your meters and see how they are and where they're going. So that's really important. Okay. But again, if it's just you, it will have to be trial and error. You'll have to do like maybe a, a two minute recording and then maybe use headphones in the recorder, listen to it, watch the meters on playback, see how high they go and you go, ooh, that's clipping, that's no good. Okay, I'm on seven, let's try it at five. So turn your mics down to five record another like two minutes playing the same thing, getting you know as loud as you would plan on going during your recording. And look at that, go, oh, it's still a little clip. Let, let's turn it down, let's try four. Okay, do it again, <laughs> you go back, you listen to it, you watch the meters on your unit, and finally it's like, oh yeah, okay, that stays in the yellow, it, it touched the red a couple times, okay, which is okay. Those momentary peaks are usually not a big problem. It's when it goes and it jams up into the red and it stays there, just like at the beginning here when we were looking at it. So it's, it's just a laborious process. But once you zero things in, write it down. Have a little notebook. I have notebooks that I use for all my recording stuff. I have all my settings and everything. Write it down, okay. Maybe, maybe you've got multiple spots and you say, okay, this is spot A and you have it marked out. When I record at spot A with this recorder and these microphones, put the mics on five and that's perfect. If I'm further back, I'm at spot B, I can turn them up to six or seven or whatever, you know, mark that. So that's really important. And all this, all this pre-planning and all this figuring this out will just help you get Really nice sounding recordings. Okay, so I'm sort of guessing here on this. I have a feeling I might be running a little hot. Let me turn these down just a touch. And here, I'm going to try it four. Okay, because I, I haven't used this in the studio in a long time. I normally use a mixer I have over here, a Zoom L8, which is an eight channel mixer. And that's what I record all my videos on. Okay, so we're gonna try this. We've got things ready. We got our mics. We did a mic check. Let's do another check here. One, two, three. Let's just hit hit a couple of I don't know 
if I'll play that loudly, but I could see the built-in mics were peaking into the red. We're going to turn that down a little. The other ones were good. They were in the yellow. Again, air on the quiet side, if it's just you recording, you can always bump it up, and hopefully it won't be too noisy. But we're going to try this here, okay? And then we're going to take this. We're going to go on the other side of my studio in the other room where I have my computer and my monitors and we're going to look at it and process it. So let's get playing. We'll get this recording and we're on. All right.
Okay, went through various textures, different mallets, different sticks, different sounds, different volumes. Let's see what we've got. Here we are in my control room looking at one of my monitors. And the questions ask, okay, in the first part, you recorded and you got all the sounds down. Now what do you do with them? How do you finish it? What do you do with it? So this part will show you what to do. Like I said, we're looking at one of my monitors. I have my favorite audio software on here, which is Logic Pro from Apple. And I've been using this for quite a few years now. I started out with GarageBand way back on one of my Apple computers years ago. And when I needed something that did more, I moved up to Logic, which is their full-blown professional audio software. But there are a lot of other great audio softwares. And this is what we call a DAW. DAW, Digital Audio Workstation. There's a lot of other great ones out there like Pro Tools and Mixbus and Reaper and uh, a lot of different ones. Some of them are free. Some of them you can get light versions for free or not too much money and then have to pay for the full-blown version. But if you're an Apple user, all Apple products, phones, iPads, and computers come with some version of GarageBand. So that gives you something to start with. Otherwise, you can get something as basic as Audacity, which is a free audio program. So now I'm going to take you from the recorded program and how I process things to end up with a finished product. So we need to look up here on the screen. Here is a little icon that is the memory card out of my recorder, out of the H6 recorder. So I'll open that up. There it is. Go through, look for today. Got a lot of stuff on here. Here's today. And there we go. There is the recordings we made. So we have actually four separate recordings. This is just a control one on the bottom. At the top, the BU Wave, that's a backup. The nice thing that I like about the H6 is you can have it record a backup recording from your onboard microphones. And that recording is at 12 decibels less volume than your main recording. So if you do have a problem and clip in your main recording, you can replace it with the backup or you could splice um, the parts from your backup into, you know, cut out the clipped parts and splice in the parts from the backup and adjust things that way. So that is the backup. The second one, the LR, that's the left, right. So those are both the XY built-in microphones at the front of the recorder. Then we see TR1 and TR2, track one and track two. Track one is my left channel, track two is my right channel. So let me move this down here. And then I have, this is a template I've made in Logic because I work in stereo a lot. So I have the two channels, one and two. Here they are on the mixer, one and two. And we will take these because this is what we're interested in mainly, the left and right. Drag them in, put them on both tracks. Now it's loading the programs on there. I will make them a little bigger so we can see. There's our audio waveforms. There we are. Now what I do, if we look over here, I have track one panned all the way to the left, my left channel, 
and track two panned all the way to the right, the right channel. So now these are in stereo. If you just put them in normally, the panning is in the middle. So we would have two mono channels in the middle. So I've panned them out. All right, so we can play this and we'll be hearing things through my monitor speakers. Turn that up a little. And we're watching our meters down here in the corner. Again, watching for clipping going into the red. Let me turn our volume up a little here. It's a big strike. We're still pretty much in the yellow there. Let me stop it here. We're going to look at the whole audio track. I can compress this. And there's the whole audio track. So now we can see where our peaks are. And there's nothing that's really up there. Now if we saw this waveform here going way up here and into the white, that would be trouble. That would be red lining, that would be clipping. So nothing here is clipping. The volume's a little low, which is okay because I can bring it up. So nothing is clipping. I don't really have to see anything that's gonna need adjustment other than I think I will probably bring the volume up a little bit. And to do that on this, I'll go to my master stereo channel and I will just add a stereo gain plug-in. This will allow me to bring the volume up. Let's see, let's bring it up about 4 dB and see how that goes. So we're already sort of past the loudest part. Jump ahead. I want to hear these quiet parts. Okay, let's stop here and talk about this. This is fairly quiet here. Sometimes what I will do, I will use what they call automation. And click on there and what I can do is I can change the volume of certain parts of each track so I might come in here and start right about here and move to like right over here on that end between those those louder parts and I might bring the, this whole middle section up a little bit on each track just to balance it out more because it's it's kind of quiet but a lot of times i just leave it as it is because i like that nice wide dynamic range where the loud parts are loud and the quiet parts are quiet but that's an option i have i can use automation i can bring the louder parts down i can bring the quieter parts up and balance things so so much it's, it's really an individual case on how the recording is. So let's jump here towards the end. I mean, we, we certainly don't have any clipping in here. And since I boosted the gain, I'm gonna go back and check out this part here where you can see it's the loudest part. But I've really learned how to identify a lot of things visually from working with audio so much like this. 
and that's one of the first things I will do is just get a look at the whole track like this and identify where are the loud parts if there's clipping parts where are the clipping parts where are the really soft parts okay and we're coming to the end okay and there we are at the end all right so let's take this I wouldn't want that so I'm going to chop off the ending there and here in the beginning we had let's go back to the very beginning and we're on all right and here we go so it's right about the start I'd probably do the same thing highlight those I can cut the beginning off and move this up there we are so like I said let's take take a quick listen to the louder part here and watch the meters here down in the corner okay that looks pretty good I, we got up there but we didn't really hit the red I could probably even push it a little higher going to leave it here for now. I want to watch this hit here. Uh, see, there we hit, hit the red there with this guy right here. The stick hit. And you can see down here, we're in the red. Let's just do that again. Watch it. Here it comes. But it's only a momentary hit. So there's another little hit the rag. I'm not going to worry about it. Unless those momentary peaks are totally crushing it, they're usually not a big problem. So I will leave those as is. Okay, let's close this out. Oh, I'll wait. Maybe we'll look at the stereo and just show the difference. Okay, so here we are. And let's say we like this. Now what? Well, we have to export it. And I can come up here and bounce this track. And I want to bounce it as a 24-bit wave file right up here at the top. I have my choice. I can bounce it as a wave or an AIFF, which is an Apple file. But I usually do everything in a wave, especially because if I'm working with video, the DaVinci Resolve video program I use works really well with wave files. So I usually bounce everything into a wave file because it's pretty universal, and I can always export it into a an mp3 if needed or into an apple lossless file if needed okay so we want that and we'll just call this stereo mix down we want it on the desktop here we go now it's bouncing it's gonna be on one of my other screens here and it's done so let me pull it up here Okay, so there's our mix down file. Now to watch it, we're gonna we're gonna look at a different program. We'll probably have to export it up here. Let me drag this down. This is a program called Fission, which I use a lot for finalizing things because it's a really nice easy to use program so here's the stereo file we just put together so we've got you can see it's like a mirror image and a couple things I want to fix if I dial in here okay this intro I might want to shorten that so I don't have that little dead space I can delete that 
And then if we go at the end here, you notice it's kind of chopped off. So I want to fade that out. Put a little fade in there. Let's put fade out. Okay. So now I have a nice kind of fade ending on there. So there's my complete stereo thing. It's 7 minutes, 71 seconds. I can put in my metadata, which is all the information that goes along with each track. I can title it, put in the artist name. If it's part of an album, put the album in there, the album artist. I can group it into different categories if I want. I can put the composer, the year, beats per minute. I never use that, but I'm sure if somebody's working with EDM or certain electronic things like that, they might want the beats so they can match up different songs. And then I can, what track it is, what disc it's on. I can put artwork in there and then I can put genre. And that will all stay with the track once I export it from here. It will stay with the track so you put it in your iTunes or whatever sort of music player and the album cover will come up and all the information. So let's play this. Let's go back to the beginning here. Here's our stereo file. And whoops, I'm stuck on that, on that intro there. Get this back. Okay. A nice quiet build up from very, very quiet. Getting louder and more dynamic. Let's skip over to the end here. We'll have that last hit. Nice solid hit on the Jupiter gong. And it'll just fade out and fade away. So let's say I'm satisfied with this here. I like the fade out. I like the intro where I cut the dead space. Everything looks good, sounds good. I could put info on it and now I could save it and all that will save to the file we just created from the mix down. Or I could export it so I have a whole new file. And here I have a, a wide choice MP3s. Flack files, Apple lossless, and a wave. We'll make this a wave and we'll export this and we'll call it um, stereo mix down final just to differentiate it. Okay. Save it on the desktop. I can close this. I don't want to save that because I already saved it here. And I'll move this up here. Here's our final file, stereo mix down. And if, if we did name this track, let's say we um, named it something, Sunset Meditation, okay, then that would be the name of this. We would have named it that, Sunset Meditation dot wave. And then we can do what we want with that file. We can upload it to things like SoundCloud or Bandcamp, other places. We can send it to people, send it uh, via Dropbox or a file sharing service. If it's small enough, we could probably email it to people and say, hey, here's my new track, have a listen. Or we could put it in whatever media player we want and put it on our phone or tablet or the computer here so that we can listen to it. And that's the whole process. You know. It, for just a basic stereo track. Not too hard. So let's go back here. And I said we were going to look at just the 
look at just the um, the stereo track. We'll add that here just to give you a comparison. All right, come on, wake up. There we go. So we're added a new track. And let's see, bring this down. As you can see, there's two tracks. So this is stereo. And here's two mono tracks, one stereo track. So that's a difference you can see. So this is the one from the XY built-in microphones, and these two are from the external microphones I used. And the stereo track is probably fine, you know. As you can see, it's not lined up because I had cut off the front here and cut off some of the back. So I would have to, if I wanted to use all of these together, I would have to align them. But let's just mute tracks one and two. And we'll go back here and let me kind of listen. This is going to be quieter. Give that a little listen. But there's our stereo track. And these are two different stereos. So this one is the XY stereo. The mics that are close together and pointed in a cross pattern, an X pattern. And the other two are the two external mics that are further apart in an ORTF pattern. So it gives you a wider stereo field. So I could blend these together and create a further track if I wanted. I could combine these two. I'd have to cut this one and line it up with these here so that they were all in sync. And then I could mix it down and blend them to create a new track with all four microphones. Or I could just take this one here, the stereo one, and bounce it down into a WAV file or whatever I want. So there you go. There's Basic Recording 101 from start to finish. There's a lot to it, but to make just a basic stereo file that you can listen to is not too difficult and you don't have to do any processing to it i haven't done any effects there's no reverb there's um, no delay i haven't done any processing on this this is just the raw file as is so if you want you could always go in there put in some reverb give it a little bigger sound that way like a bigger room and if you want to play around with it, you could add all kinds of different delays. You could add flanger. You could go in there and use EQ to boost the bass if you want. You know, cut cut the highs down some. You can do a lot of processing to your track. But in this case, we just wanted a raw track that sounds pretty much like it was recorded. So it's it's a very accurate record of you know what I did. So this is the type of thing you can do if you get a recorder is you know record yourself at home wherever your place is your bedroom your basement your living room wherever your gear is set up you know, record yourself practicing record yourself playing and then make tracks you know edit them down like this and listen to them study them and keep a keep them in a file keep a record of them it's interesting to go back, you know, six months back in time, a year back in time. What was what was I doing six months ago? What did I sound like? What was I doing a year ago? What did I sound like? You know, what was I doing five years ago? What did that sound like? So you can chart your progress as an artist, you know, both in your technique. How is my technique? improved how am i playing better and also in just your ideas how have my ideas changed over time and if you've added more instruments you can listen to how have i expanded my sound with more instruments or more mallets or something so this is i think you know a really excellent thing for everybody to do and you could even just record yourself on your phone it's it's simple as that and then edit your phone recordings like this. 
they won't be as good a quality because the microphones on the telephone one are very small and two they're designed mostly for the mid-range for the human voice but you can use them i mean everybody has a phone an iphone or an android phone everybody has a decent phone you don't have to run out and buy anything start with that and some free audio software like i said audacity or some others or garage band if you're an apple person and you're in business and then you could there are some quality microphones you can buy for iphones or android phones that plug in and give you a better sound because they have bigger microphones better quality microphones or you can buy a small recorder starting like a hundred dollars Tascam and Zoom both have their basic recorders are around a hundred dollars and you can work up from there but you can get like the Zoom H1N stereo recorder built-in mics does a great job I have one of those that I drag with me all over the place I stick it in my pocket sometimes for field recordings in case I come across something interesting nature wise or you know construction and industry sounds and I'll pull it out and record I bring it to gigs because it's easy to just throw in a case and I can record my gig I record rehearsals with it it's a great little unit and the quality is really good it's it's really good if I want a little better quality I'll bring one of my bigger units and especially use external mics like we were doing today all right this is getting kind of long but uh, I really wanted to go through the whole process if you have any questions put them down below I'd be glad to try to answer them and I you know I really hope you got something out of this this basic beginning to ending of a recording so take care we will see you next time